afternoon. This is Dr. Duke Majin. It is May 12th, 2020, and it's been an exciting day. <laughs> well, this next patient is an uh, interesting case because she's had a fusion at L34, L45, and I have to say the surgeon did an, a stunning job. If you can see the x-ray, you'll see how nice the surgery was. All the hardware is in good position, and the cages are big, and they create a curve backwards. But this patient has developed something called the Jason segment disease after the fusion, and now the disc below the fusion is a problem. It's the L5S1 disc, and it's damaged. But it's damaged, and it can be repaired, and we believe it is a source of her back pain. So. It's a nice looking disc, it just is causing pain. All right, sweetheart, lay down. We're gonna get started. I'm just touching your back like I told you I would. So at this point, maybe a little, you know, Versed, but something, but I, I need her awake in about five minutes to tell me if she's having any pain in her leg. All right. I'm just mashing around your back, okay? Yeah, I'm going to give you some numbing medicine. You'll feel a little sick and burn. Okay, I apologize. Yeah, I know. That's no fun. But we're going to give you some medicine to relax you a little bit, calm you down. And then once I'm in the right spot, then we'll be able to put you to sleep with propofol. But we can't do that just yet. We just got to kind of relax you a little bit, okay? We can't put you to sleep just yet. Okay, so for those of you watching, she has an incision on the middle of her back. This is the middle. The incision literally starts here and ends here. It's big. That's fusion surgery. You have to open up things and usually get in there and put screws and rods. All right, if you feel pain, say ouch. That means I'm going to stop and give you, you know, more some more medicine if I can, all right? Now, I'm going to be talking to everybody while I'm doing your surgery. I'm going to be talking to my team, and I may even talk to you. But you're going to hear me say shot, and what that means is I want an x-ray picture. Shot. No problem. Take your time. All right. We'll figure it out. Yeah, bring your, your fluoro base. So all these surgeries, for those of you watching, they are live stream surgeries. So we're not editing anything out. You're getting the full OR experience as it, un un as it happens. And, um, you know, we are going to have issues that, you know, reality is in the real world in the operating room. Believe it or not, it's not a perfectly quiet environment. There's some talking and sometimes some yelling. <laughs> Hopefully not too much yelling. Okay, so on the fluoro shot, I need your help. We um, usually start with an AP on the lumbars. Yeah, so I need you to do is wag it. I need you to wag. Let's just stick with the lateral for now since you're already here. So folks, if you're watching, you can see the screws and rods from the prior surgery. We're aiming for the disc at the bottom of the spine. And we're going to wag the fluoro to try to line up the end plate a little bit better. I think it's worse. So we're looking at the L5 end plate. That's the bone. Yeah, that's better. Let's move the whole fluoro north. We've got a little too much hip. So the one of the first things we have to do is we have to get the x-ray machine positioned better. I think you need to go further north with the base and then wag my side south. All right, that's better, but it's still not where I want it. So let's try releasing the wag and let me control it. Shot. That's just really good right there. Yeah, it's good right there. Lock it down. I mean, we could be further north. You're getting a lot of hip. 
to having to push through all that tough tissue that's unnecessary. So if you want to move the whole base a little more north, I think the issue is she's just got, um, yeah, go further north, further, further, further right there, stop, and now lock the base and release the wag, and I'll bring the wag down and shot. That's close. How about that right there, shot? Anything better or worse? Hard for me to tell. Shot? One more shot. I think that's a uh, shot. I think I went too far. Uh, shot. I think we're okay there. Let's leave it there for now. Yeah. Hold on, I'm not ready yet. Are you comfortable? All right, we're, everything's going okay. The first part, I need you awake. You might feel some discomfort, just tell me. Shot. Shot. No, you're okay. I can give her some, some local. Shot. Where do you feel that? In your back? I'll just give her a little bit of local. This would help a little bit. Yeah, I hadn't given enough local, so. Shot. If you move the flow, we lose the needle. So you got to do it without moving the flow. A lot of scar tissue. All right, relax. You're okay. All the way down to the foot, huh? All right. Is it better? Shot. Relax. That's why we have you awake, by the way. Shot. So you can tell me exactly that. Because we are working around your nerves. Shot. Yeah, this is the worst part of the surgery. I'm sorry. Yeah. Once we get through this, though, you'll be you'll be able to go to sleep and not have to worry about it. Shot. What am I eating here? Facet. Yes, that's exactly where you should feel it. Shot. Well, it could be that your um, muscles are tightening up, because they are, and then you're just moving something on the right side. We're not on your right side. Shot. Shot. Give me an AP. Our trajectory looks pretty good, but the there's a bunch of bone there, which could be her facet joint. Yeah, it's her facet. All right.
let's go um, back to a lateral. Um, we need to wag a little bit. Shot. When you take the shot, you got to make sure the fluoro is still, otherwise you get a, like a really weird shot. I don't know, Luis. Just not getting that 5-1 disc space, nice. Even the sacrum, I can't get that lined up well, shot. Sean, you there's a motorhome out there? Everyone asked me about that. It's so funny. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Lock it. Thank you. You want to buy it? <laughs> I've been trying to sell it. Uh, tell me about it. Shot. We use it for racing, you know, when we go racing, Sean. But we haven't been racing very much in Florida lately. Wow. Where do you feel that? I feel that right there. In your back. Yeah. All right, shot. Shot. I feel that down my leg. Down your leg. Down my left leg. How far down? Way down. Oh. Me and AP. Well, the good news is we're nowhere near your nerve. Good. And lateral. Yeah. We're a mile away. Um, I wonder if we need to I don't know I think there's a little bit of that going on planing um, let's try lifting your side a little bit just like three degrees and get a shot I definitely changed it but did it make it worse I think it made it worse the other way yeah, go six degrees. That's better. That's definitely better. But I'm still not seeing the end plate at 5-1 that well. But all the other bones are lining up pretty good. So we must not be very far off. You still have it going all the way down? Yeah. Yeah, we're actually not near your nerve, so maybe you just tightening up. That may be part of the thing. Her muscles are pretty tight, so she's very anxious. I wonder if we can... Um, I think we're okay for right now, actually. All right, let's see what I can do here. How's the blood pressure? I wouldn't go any higher than that. Sean? I want to have a little bit lower trajectory. Shot. 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 That's where I'm at. Yes. Just. We're dealing with a lot of the scar tissue from your first surgery is just getting in the way. So I'm trying to navigate around it. That's where we are. Yeah. Shot. It's in her back. Yeah. 
Let me give her some more numbing medicine. Start a little bit higher. Shot. 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 Very fibrous. Very fibrous, very tough. Horses around her facets. Shot. Yeah, I mean, it's massive amounts of scar tissue. Incredible. Shot. You comfortable? Where do you feel that, Shot? Where? Just your back, not down your leg. Not down your leg. All right, are you comfortable? What's wrong? Where does it where does it hurt? Okay. All right. Now what was your biggest problem that you came and you came for back pain, leg pain? What did you come for? I understand, but what did that cause? Like, did it cause pain for you? Back pain. Electrical shocks down which leg? Got it. Is that the pain you have? I have good news for you. That's going to be gone when we're done with surgery. How bad was that on a scale of 1 to 10, propofol? 10? Is that where you get your pain usually? Okay, folks, did you see that? That is a discogram. There's no warning. There's no signaling. She has no idea I'm injecting the disc. But you can see it created horrible pain for her. That's because the disc that I just injected is the cause of her pain. That is a definitive test. It's called a discogram. Very few doctors do it. Insurance companies hate when you do it because it ends up sometimes resulting in surgery. And they don't want to pay for surgery. You're going to be okay, sweetheart. Lay still. Don't get up. When you wake up, surgery will be all over. We found the bad disc. That was the L5-S1 disc. You got a lateral. Let's go get your back to a lateral. So she has a tear in the back of the disc, and that's where the pain's coming from. If you look at her MRI scan, the disc looks pretty good. You can almost not even notice anything wrong with the disc on the MRI. However, there is a small area of a tear that I could see on the MRI Therefore, based on the location of her pain clinically where she pointed to on her back, plus the MRI with a small tear, plus the fact the fusion is fused, I knew that this patient had discogenic back pain from L5-S1, and I knew the laser surgery would fix it. This is a very common scenario, folks. Just about everybody with a bulging or herniated disc with back pain has exactly this problem. So we got 10 out of 10 concordant at L5-S1. I want you to count from 1 to 100 out loud. Can you do that? She's asleep. Good. All right. Lateral. All right. I got to make sure the guide wire is out through the front shot. Shot. That looks like the guide wire there, right? You agree? Yeah, I agree. All right, I'm going to take the needle out, leave the guide wire in. There's a technique for that. It's twisting and then holding the guide wire stable. Shot, you always want to check and make sure you're not moving the guide wire in or out. This is endoscopic surgery, folks. I did not create endoscopic spine surgery. I just perfected it. And the reason I perfected it was, of course, the technique but more importantly, I added something to this surgery that no one else in the world does, and it's called an annular debridement. 
I described it in my original paper that I published in 2012, eight years ago, where I described the annular debridement as the key to eliminating chronic back pain or neck pain. I'm the only surgeon in the world that does it. So if you want to get it fixed without major surgery like a fusion, you come see me and we'll take care of it. Don't expect to see this done anywhere else because it's not. All right, now we still have to negotiate her scar tissue and her enlarged facet joints. And that's not going to be easy. I can tell you that right now. It's going to want to bend and redirect this dilator. Luis is the consummate, wonderful assistant who pays attention to the details that I love. Shot. Uh, <laughs> this is not going to be fun. So I got to advance this thing past all this scar tissue. And that's what's hanging it up right now. And I got to do that without moving the uh, needle, the, the guide wire. <clears throat> because right now the guide wire is probably being deflected. Is that it right there? Yes. All right, we're making good progress. Of course, I do this, you can see, with my hands. Now, there's another way to do it. It's using the mallet. Mallet is a hammer. But uh, this way is, I think, a little bit safer. Um, just the way that I'm doing it as I'm twisting and I'm pulling down gently. It's the wrong thing if you come here and try to shove it in. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, I love it. We're right on the disc right on the back of the disc where the herniation is. And we're gonna shot, go into the disc. I can feel the tear in the disc itself. And it's, it's pretty substantial. Shot. So, um, yeah, she doesn't like it. You can see her moving. But I'm okay with a little bit of movement as long as you're okay with it. That's it right there, shot. Uh-huh. Shot. All right. So now that we have our dilator in, I'm going to put our tube. So for those of you wondering, how do you do this surgery? Can you zoom in there, Sean, and show them this tube? This is my McDonald's, metal McDonald's shake straw. The whole surgery is done through this seven millimeter wide tube. That's why it's a seven millimeter incision. Of course, we put the endoscope down there and we can actually see what we're doing. We're gonna show you that view in just a minute. And we use the mallet once again to, in a controlled fashion, advance the, the uh, tube over the dilator. Make sure that I'm not advancing the dilator. Shot. And once I get this tube in place inside the disc, shot, then I can take the dilator out and we can do the surgery. Shot. Perfect. So we're inside the disc. This is the L5S1 disc. Now take a look, folks. The entire surgery is done through that little tube. No bone, no bone has been removed from her back. Every other spine surgeon is going to cut in the middle, move the muscles over, and then drill a hole in the bone to get to the disc. And they can't fix back pain with that surgery. I can fix back pain with this surgery and leg symptoms both. And I do it from the side, and we have a tiny little cut this big, okay? And there's no bone being removed at all. That's the, one of the advantages of this surgery. Microdiscectomy removes bone. Laminectomy removes bone. Those procedures weaken your spine. All right, let's go ahead and get the floral out. So up and out. We're ready for the endoscope. Let me show you the endoscope. 
The endoscope has several parts. Sean, are you getting all this? Yes, I am. All right. So it looks a bit complicated. Can you see? Go ahead and pull yes, the uh, fluoroscope back. All right, you got this tube, which is irrigation. The irrigation comes out the tip. See that? That removes blood and debris. This here is the light source. It's a fiber optic light source. Turn it on. Thank you. So you can see how bright it is. It sends light all the way down the scope to the end. And then you have the camera which records the images and projects it onto a screen. And then we have the tube that we work through, okay? We have some suction here. So we're going to put our scope down, down the rabbit hole. Lights off, please. And we're inside the disc. Remember, I told you her disc is pretty much normal looking, except for this small area that's been torn in the back causing pain. Okay, so my goal is to remove the herniation, but also to repair the tear. Laser. Now when I repair this disc today, and if I were to do that discogram next week, she won't have any pain because we would have ended the pain with the laser. And the way we do that is by, it's called an annular debridement. Man, this is hard right here. L5S1 is tough, huh? It's always tough. We we're just talking about the L5S1 disc is the hardest disc to fix in the lumbar spine because of the angle that it projects out to on the skin surface is very very high up towards their ribs and thoracic area as a matter of fact there's very few surgeons in the world that do this type of surgery through the through the foramen using an endoscope because at l5s1 because they just don't even try it's too hard to do you see how it took me about five minutes to get in there it would take most surgeons, it would be impossible. Any, any surgeon that does endoscopic spine surgery, let's just say there's 100 in the world. And of those 100 endoscopic spine surgeons that know the transforaminal approach, um, probably only five of them do L5S1, the, the bottom disc, even though it's the second most common disc to be affected. And the reason for that is L5S1 is the hardest to get to because of the angle, the angulation of the facets and the, and the disc space. So a lot of surgeons won't even do it. The blue dye is normal. I put that in there during the discogram. It helps me find the tear. It helps me identify degenerated disc material. So we're gonna be done in 15 minutes. Huh? Yeah. Tell them I do his rhizotomy for him, but I don't know how. Maybe I should stick around and learn. I think I might do that. Tell him he has a fellow. So clearly her disc is the cause of her pain. We're gonna treat her facet joints as well, but since we're here, just in case they're contributing, we don't wanna to have to put her through another procedure if they are contributing to her pain. All right, what you're seeing, how is she doing? Perfect. What you're seeing, folks, is the inside of the disc at L5S1 on the left side. All this stuff I'm zapping with the laser is a tear in the annulus with granulation tissue it's trying to heal itself but it can't so this is all bad tissue that needs to go away in order to heal the disc Sean we have any questions none so far standby laser some of it just is so massive you want to grab it out with a pituitary
this is all part of the herniation. It's not just the nucleus pulposus, but it's also the annulus fibrosus that's torn and the scar tissue scarring the nuclear material to the annulus. So the laser we use is a homium YAG laser. The settings that I use are uh, 20, what is it, 20 hertz? No. 30 watts, 30 watts yeah. which is how many hertz? 15 hertz? Huh? I think it's 15 hertz with uh, two joules okay. per pulse, okay. right? Yep. So it's two joules of energy delivered with every pulse. There's 15 pulses per second. By the way, this patient is a nurse. I didn't say that to you before, but this is a nurse. We get a lot of nurses who come here to Duke Spine Institute because they know they've seen the horror shows at the hospital with spine surgery. And they know there aren't many spine surgeons in the world that they would trust to operate on them. If you're a spine surgeon that does surgery on nurses, you know you've been vetted and the nurses talk to each other and they make sure that they know they go to the right place am i right yeah they're probably the one of some of the best consumers healthcare consumers they make sure they get the best care so This is nice because the fusion surgery, if we had to do a fusion here at L5S1, which we could be doing, by the way, she didn't want a fusion. Um, the fusion here, we would have had to take in the other screws and rods out to be able to fuse, at least the rods and the set screws, because we would have to extend the rods further south. We'd have to take a cage and put it in this disc space as well. So by having the laser, she avoided another fusion surgery. That's part of the herniation right there. You can see the scar tissue. What I think happened with this disc is probably injured with the original back injury, but was somewhat silent and healed itself for the most part, which most disc herniations do heal themselves. You don't need surgery for most disc herniations. They heal themselves, meaning they become symptomatic on their own, asymptomatic on their own. They don't have symptoms. And then what happens is uh, she probably had, you know, something happen, maybe bent forward or fall or something, who knows what, that just set this herniation back off again. Once a disc has been herniated and injured, it will repair itself to a degree, but it never goes back to 100%. And it's always like almost just waiting to have another accident that sets it off and re-injures it. Imagine taking a soda can and put it in your hand and hold the top and the bottom and push together and try to crush it. It's not easy to crush it, right? It takes a lot of force. But once you start crushing it, then it's easier to finish it. And that's kind of what a disc injury is like. The initial injury is, is hard to do because discs are pretty tough. And it's like crushing the can for the first time, getting it to start crushing. It's not easy. But then once you get it going, you can, uh, it may stop for a little while. That's like the disc healing itself, but then it'll start going again with just a little re-injury. Having a hard time. There we go. Ready? Yeah.
All right, I'm gonna keep moving the tube further back until we're done. You can see the tear right there. That's the annular tear. That's what we're here to fix. That's what the, this procedure, the Duke Laser Disc Repair does. It fixes the annular tear. There's no other surgery in the world that does this. It's the only surgery that repairs the tear. And by doing so, it eliminates the back pain. That's why most back surgery doesn't get rid of back pain because they're not fixing the source. We have a question. Sure. One of our viewers is wondering, how much of the disc do you take out and how do you close the hole behind it? Yeah, great question. So two questions. One of our viewers says, well, Dr. Duke, how much of the disc are you taking out there? The answer is we're not really taking any of the disc out. We're taking the herniation out and we're cleaning up the tear. So we're not taking any normal disc out. We're just taking the abnormal damaged part of the disc out. What volume does that represent? It represents 5% of the disc volume, 5%. So on an MRI, you won't even notice a difference. If you get an MRI before and after, you will not see a change in the volume of the disc material that's there before or after. It's negligible. And then what seals this tear when I'm done? Well, the body will seal it. The patient's body will seal the tear itself. You see, the reason they have back pain or neck pain if this is in the neck is because they've been trying to seal this tear for a long time. And ever since they started having pain, that's their body's effort to seal the tear. But they couldn't because all this junk was in here. Now that I'm cleaning it up, they're gonna be able to seal this tear without this nuclear material being here. So actually their body, the patient will seal the tear themselves, all natural. That's one of the beauties of the Duke Laser Disc Repair Surgery you're watching. We don't put any screws, rods, metal, bone, cadaver bone, met nothing. No plastic, no nothing. It's all natural. Your body heals itself. We just help your body heal. I'll give you an example. In, um, in medicine, there are patients like diabetics that have um, poor wound healing. You may have met a diabetic patient that um, had a cut or a sore that just won't heal. So the surgeon has to go in there and clean it all up by cl cutting out the bad areas and then they put the skin back together and the, the, it heals. But you have to clean out the grunge, the dead material, the dead devitalized tissue first. That's what I'm doing for the disc. I'm cleaning out the devitalized tissue that's preventing the disc from healing. Again, you won't find this surgery anywhere else in the world. It's only done here at Duke Spine Institute. We're the pioneers in endoscopic spine surgery and this type of procedure. Now, sure, there are surgeons that do endoscopic discectomies. That's not what we're doing. Those are used to treat just leg symptoms or arm symptoms, not back pain, not neck pain. This surgery treats both. We have another question. Yes. One of our viewers is wondering, can you do annular debridement if you've had a previous PL? I'm so sorry, Sean. Your voice is too low. I can't hear you. Is this a bit better? Uh, not much. Can you make it louder? We're almost done here with this tear, by the way. Go ahead. OK, how about this? Oh, I love it. Yeah, okay. I can hear you now. One of our users is wondering, can you do annular debridement after you've had a previous PLDD in the lumbar spine and nucleoplasty in the cervical spine? Yes. So if you've already had a PLDD, a percutaneous lumbar decompressive discectomy, or a nucleoplasty in the cervical spine, the answer is yes. You can have the Duke laser disc repair done to, to fix the disc that they, those surgeries don't fix because they're not very good surgeries, sorry. I don't perform them because they don't work. So yes, this surgery you're watching today, the Duke Laser Disc Repair, could fix the disc and the pain from those discs that those other surgeries were supposed to fix but didn't fix. I hope that's clear. Yep, come see us and we'll fix you. 
just about done folks look at all that material gone remember the whole thing was filled up before now we've zapped it away that is your tear that's cleaned up and you got a little bit of herniation way down there the blue stuff and just about finished i'll be done in three minutes doctor so just to give you an idea how much longer it's going to take now we're going to put a band-aid on this incision and this patient's going to go home in 30 40 minutes from now it's a very quick recovery it's like having a colonoscopy except you know, we don't go in the colon. At least we're not, we never have and we hopefully never will. Um, but you get my point. It's like a colonoscopy from the standpoint of the anesthesia. You don't have a tube down your throat. It's all done with sedation. We call it MAC. Basically, IV sedation with propofol. It's good stuff. Keeps you asleep, comfortable, nice dreams. And when you wake up, it's all done. Laser. I've got about two minutes left. Great questions, by the way, and I appreciate the audience asking questions. That's how you learn. All right, so this is it right here. I'm looking at the 12 o'clock position, the epidural fat, the uh, traversing nerve root will be right up there a little bit further. The exiting nerve root is to my left at nine o'clock. And I'm gonna show you that nerve in just a second. That's gonna be the left L5 nerve root. That's the one that was getting bothered by the herniation, irritated by the herniation and you're going to see that nerve in just one minute. Sometimes it's covered with fat. Not much I can do about that. I'm not going to mess with it. But hopefully in her case it won't be. Why do nerves have fat around them you ask? Because fat is a great storage form of energy. And nerves use a lot of energy. Nervous tissue uses the most energy in the whole body per gram of tissue. More than any other tissue, more than the heart. The heart is the second, the kidneys are the third, but the nerves are the most. All right, we're done, laser off. Let's take a look at that nerve. There it is right there, you see the white thing? Right there at 11 o'clock, that is her left L5 nerve root, okay? Beautiful, all done. This is the best surgery in the world if you have a herniated disc or a bulging disc. It doesn't get any better than this. This patient's going to go home in 30 minutes. Her pain is going to be gone. How do I know that? I've done so many of these cases I could tell you. That's why people come from all over to have the surgery done literally from all over the world. Unfortunately, they haven't been coming lately because all the flights to the United States have, have been uh, blocked from COVID-19, but things are starting to open up. I know there are still countries that won't allow travel to the United States and the United States won't allow travel from them. But hopefully Europe will start opening, Canada will start opening soon. We get a lot of patients from Canada they love watching these surgeries. They love coming down and having their back fixed. All right, so Luis, a little pressure. Let me show you. Yeah, nice job. All right, let me show you the incision. Can you guys see this? So the whole surgery was done through that cut right there. You guys see that? Yes, we can. That's uh, about half the width of a dime. Okay, uh, any more questions from the audience? Yes, we do have one remaining. Okay. Um, let me come to the conference room and answer it. I just want to say I've got a Ray Tech off the field. I want to thank everybody for their hard work today. Great job.
And let me come over to the conference room and answer that question. EBL, I'm going to call four mills. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us for the post-op Q&A. We have Dr. Duke in the room with us, ready to take some questions. The first one comes from a user on Facebook named Dermot. He asks, do you have to cut the ligamentum flavum in order to access the disc? Will it heal on its own if you do? 
Derek? Dermot, I believe, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Thank you for asking, that's a really good question. So we were asked a question about something called the ligamentum flavum. And ligamentum flavum simply means yellow ligament in Latin. Most of the medical terminology around today is based on Latin. And ligamentum flavum simply means yellow ligament because the ligament truly is a yellowish color in most people. Um, so the ligamentum flavum does extend under the lamina out to the facet joint and even into the foramen where it becomes the foraminal ligament. So the answer to your question is no. With the Duke laser disc repair procedure, we are approaching the disc through the outside of the foramen, the opposite direction, the opposite side of the foramen than a microdiscectomy would. So if a surgeon is doing a microdiscectomy or more traditional type surgery for a disc herniation, they would go uh, through the ligament flavum and remove part of it to get to the herniation. We are actually going from the outside of the foramen to the inside, whereas a microdiscectomy goes from medial to, to lateral, so the opposite way. Um, but in summary, we do not have any ligament that we're damaging or moving or cutting during the surgery you watched today, the Duke laser disc repair. Like I said, there's absolutely no disadvantage in the world for the Duke laser disc repair surgery you just watched over a microdiscectomy, laminectomy, fusion, or artificial disc. Of all those surgeries that are typically done, the Duke laser disc repair is by far the best. It is, there is nothing that it does that's worse on any count in any way than any other surgery. The incision is smaller, seven millimeters. The, um, there's no bone or ligaments removed. We don't even have to really manipulate the nerve root like you do with a microdiscectomy where you have to retract it medially to be able to get the herniation and you could injure the nerve while retracting it. You don't have to worry about damaging the nerve root by opening the lamina and doing a laminotomy or a partial facetectomy where you could actually bite, instead of biting bone with your instrument, you can bite the nerve because the nerve is right there and it's very soft. Um, and you don't have the destabilization that you get with more traditional spine surgery like microdiscectomy, laminectomy, where you're removing um, part of the joints like the facet joint where you're gonna destabilize that segment and make it weak so that it ends up needing to be fused shortly after the surgery. So with the Duke laser disc repair, we're not doing anything. Uh, we're cutting the skin, we're spreading the muscle seven millimeters, and then literally we pop out right where the herniation is. So there's no damage to any tissue other than the skin where we make a seven millimeter cut. And that's very, very easy to recover from. That's one of the main reasons why this surgery is, is better than any other surgery out there for treating a herniated disc in the spine because we don't have to take bone, because we don't have to remove ligament, because we don't get the bleeding, because we don't have to retract the nerve. You saw where the nerve was at the end. It was just outside the retractor. And it's safe and protected as long as you do the surgery properly. That's why it took me a little while in the beginning to get the, the um, angle proper on the fluoro. If you don't have the angle proper on the fluoro, you could actually be going into the nerve without you knowing it because of... Um, you know, the spine is not lined properly with your instrument. So it's very important if you're going to do endoscopic spine surgery that you make sure that you have a true lateral view at the disc level that you're operating on, that the end plates are lined up perfectly, the pedicles are lined up perfectly, and that you, um, you're going to need to use your WAG uh, feature on your fluoro to get, it, to get it lined up nicely. As long as you do that before you start putting your needle in and do the rest of the surgery, you, your chances of injuring the nerve root is very low. All right, and we have another question from a viewer, Nick, on Facebook. He's wondering, why do you think so many fusions and microdiscectomies are done? How often is it that they make the spine lose stability afterwards? Well, it's a great question. So somebody is asking, why do you think so many microdiscectomies and fusions are done? I mean, I can tell you why. Microdiscectomies have been around for years, probably 60, 70 years. I don't know exactly, but I would say probably 60 to 70 years now. 
And it's a surgical technique that was developed a long time ago when the instruments that we had available to do surgery were of a certain type that allowed that type of surgery to be done. But over the last, you know, 60 years, um, there have been advances in surgical technique and also instruments. And the problem is, is that at academic centers where these techniques are taught to surgeons as they're learning and they're training, remember if you're a neurosurgeon you have seven years of training, if you're an orthopedic surgeon you're going to have five plus one in spine as a fellowship, so that's six years. These doctors are being taught old techniques during training. And the fusion side, the reason why fusions have kind of progressed so much in number is because a fusion requires the, the placement of hardware, which is your screws, rods, cages. That hardware costs a lot of money for the hospital, but there's a beneficiary to that hardware, and that beneficiary is the company that makes the hardware. They make literally billions of dollars a year in profit. Some of those companies, if you want to look them up, include Medtronic, uh, Synthes was one that they've sold several years ago, and um, Stryker is another one, Nuvasiv, Alphatech, the list literally goes on and on. And when I started spine surgery 22, 23 years ago, there were probably one-fifth of those companies out there making these implants, but they were making a $1,000 a screw. So what do you think those companies that sell these implants do? Well, they go around and they promote surgeons to use their products. And those products are used for fusion or artificial discs nowadays. So really a lot of the advancements in surgery techniques with surgeons that are in training is due to promotion of products manufactured, sold, distributed by these companies like Medtronic. And the more they sell, the more profit they make. So they go into the training centers at the universities in the United States, and they literally become friends with all the nurses, with all the OR staff. They buy donuts and pizza every day, every week, and they get everybody kind of hooked on their product. And then they start training the residents to do the fusion. So there's a, a marketing-driven educational component for surgeons that have the spine, like neurosurgeons or peak surgeons, that are learning these techniques. I was the same way. When I was a neurosurgery resident, we had the Medtronic rep, the Synthes rep. They were always in the operating room. Every single day of the week, they had three reps, as a matter of fact, at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And we had probably some days three or four operating rooms running all day doing cases where they're implanting metal and screws and cages in the spine. And those companies quite literally would make five to ten million dollars a year off of fusions being done at the, at the university hospitals with residents involved, residents being the trainees. Okay, so we come out of training being taught to do spinal fusions and taught what the indications for spinal fusions are. And, you know, surgeons are getting trained with these techniques. So the endoscopic surgery that I'm doing, there is no implants. There's no screws. There's no cages. There's nobody making money from doing my surgeries. It's an all-natural process. You, you invest in the equipment. It's, you know, it's expensive. But once you've made the investment, you don't have any um, implants, you don't have any reusable stuff. So um, you don't have disposable stuff, right? So there's really not a lot of money to be made by anyone, so it's not really promoted. Does that make sense? But it is a much better surgery for the patient. It's just not being promoted by a marketing company that has relationships with everybody at the hospital in the operating room that's promoting their screws and rods and cages, which are used for fusions, or artificial discs, which are implanted. So it's a long explanation, but it's an honest, true explanation. Until we can fix that, we're going to continue to have 
problems with surgeons being trained to do surgeries that are old fashioned or that are making money for them or for an implant company. Um, the amount of money that I make doing a fusion is much greater than the money I make doing this laser surgery. The reason I do the laser surgery is because that's what the patient wants. They don't want to have another fusion. And um, as long as, you know, money is the issue, doctors are going to end up being driven or corralled into going and doing more complicated surgeries like fusions. And money is always going to be an issue, whether it's the patient's money, whether it's the um, implant manufacturer's money when they want to make more money, whether it's the insurance company's money, they don't want to pay for certain types of surgery. I don't know if you're aware of this, but artificial discs still aren't paid for by Medicare. Medicare is the biggest insurance company in the United States, and they won't pay for artificial discs. They call them experimental. It's baloney that they're experimental. Medicare's full of it. They just don't want to pay for artificial discs because they feel that if they start paying for them, then a lot of people will want the artificial disc, and people that weren't going to have surgery will start having surgery. And that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid that the people of America will actually want to get medical care because there's a better treatment out there. And that's going to end up costing them more money. And to be honest with you, Medicare isn't even about the government's money anymore. It's about Blue Cross Blue Shield managing the government's money. And for every procedure they can deny, they get 30 cents on the dollar. Okay, that's their kickback from our government. So by saying we don't cover things like artificial disc surgery in the spine, they're denying that procedure. They're saving the government money through the Medicare program, but they're also getting a commission for every dollar they save. So it's a really screwed up system, to be honest with you. Um, but I don't see it getting fixed anytime soon, which is why we broadcast these surgeries to teach doctors, nurses, people, anybody that's interested in learning the truth about surgery on the spine. This is a much better surgery, the endoscopic surgery. It's much better than anything else out there, whether it's an old technique like a microdiscectomy, laminectomy, or a newer technique like a fusion. The endoscopic surgery is 10 times better. Unfortunately, you're not going to hear about it because it's very hard to do and you need special equipment to do it and nobody's really trained to do it. So they're all going to tell you to do what they do, which is fusions and artificial discs and microdiscectomies. Pe doctors don't tell their patients to get the best treatment because they may not know what the best treatment is. They tell their patients to get the treatment that they offer, the best treatment that they offer. Um, at Duke Spine Institute, we offer all spine treatments. We do fusions, artificial discs, endoscopic laser surgery, laminectomies, microdiscectomies. You name it, we can do it, and we do it. Uh, but the best surgery is the one you just watch, which is endoscopic Duke laser disc repair. That was our last question, and it's been a great day hanging out with you guys and gals for um, two cases. We saw a posterior cervical laminectomy infusion earlier today. You got to see the spinal cord. You got to see screws and rods going in the back of the neck into the spine. Um, and then you just saw a Duke laser disc repair endoscopic procedure to repair a damaged disc that's adjacent to a fusion. And this patient uh, did not want to go through another fusion, so they had a tiny little incision, and we repaired the disc endoscopically. Thanks for being with us. We'll have more surgeries in the weeks to come. In the meantime, stay safe. Um, look forward to our next time together.